going to begin part number three now of the work of preparation. And uh, as we begin, as usual, if you'll join me as we kneel in prayer. <clears throat> My Father in heaven, I dare not stand before your people <clears throat> in my strength. But Father, I ask again now for a double portion of your Holy Spirit, a power, Father, to from on high, to anoint my lips, to bless my heart, my soul, to be totally surrendered to your leading and to your will now. I thank you and praise you, Father, for the wonderful and precious truths that you've brought forward at this time. And I pray, Father, now that it wouldn't be I, but you that would represent these correctly and in their right light. And also, Father, for the purpose that your Holy Spirit can impress them upon the hearts and minds of those that are yet to hear these truths. I praise your holy name and thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. And Father, we ask that your holy angels would minister unto us as we desire to sit at your feet and once again learn from you the truth for this time. We thank you and we praise you and we believe in you, Father. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. amen. Welcome. Right on in. Now I'll say, as our guests are finding their seat, what I'll say to you is, is that the parts one and part two have already been accomplished. This is part three. And what we want to deal with today is identifying the role of prophecy from the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. Okay. Here we go. So what we're dealing with is now, we've, I've, I've laid the groundwork in parts one and two of identifying in part the role of prophecy, and I've said things that I'm now going to set out to prove. And what I've said is that there's a three-step work identified in Acts 3.19 that deals with repent, then be converted in order that your sins can be blotted out. It's these three steps that I think that we have not related to correctly. Um, it's been identified as the, uh, the everlasting gospel. Uh, myself, I prefer to identify it as Sister White did, and that is the glorious manifestation of the power of God. And there's a reason that I, that I choose that language. Nevertheless, the first two steps or phases of this work are identifying the work that is happening within us in order that the third step is something that God does. It's where the sins begin to be blotted out. Okay, where she says that our character, our, our character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. And we're going to read that quote if we get to that today. Uh, it's within your handout. <clears throat> so beginning here with the prophetic warning message, I want to read to you first from Great Controversy 88, 594, paragraph 1. Before the crucifixion, the Savior explained to His disciples that He was to be put to death and to rise again from the tomb now what is that? When Jesus tells you something that's going to happen in advance, it's, it's a prophetic message. Is it a warning to them? Is it given to be a warning to them? Absolutely. Okay? They are to know in advance that what Christ is to go through. And, that, and that's why He's telling them in advance, so that they can be prepared. Watch as we read on. And the angels were present, she says, to impress His words on minds and hearts. But the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke. And they could not tolerate the thought that he in whom all their hopes centered should suffer an ignominious death. The words which they needed to remember, what was, what was it that they needed to remember? They needed to remember the prophetic warning message. They needed to remember that. Okay? Were banished from their minds, and when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus as fully destroyed their hopes as if He had not forewarned them. Now, I'm going to read this next sentence and then I want to tie some things together in our thinking. What is written about here is, the, is in the time of Christ with His disciples. Okay? So let's read the next sentence. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. 
Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation. And the time of trouble will find them unready. So here's what I, wanna, I want us to consider. Okay, Going back into this quote, where it says, the words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds. Who banished them? The devil. No. Who banished them from their minds? They themselves. They themselves banished those. They didn't want to hear that. Didn't want to hear about it. It was too painful, too hard to consider. And what I want to tell you is, is that when we tell Adventists today, when Adventists are hearing that their probation closes at the Sunday Law, they banish it from their mind. Too hard to hear. Too close. Too personal. Now watch. And when the time of trial come, when does our time of trial come? Sunday. At the Sunday Law crisis, doesn't it? Okay? At the time of, when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. Why were they unprepared? Because they refused to be prepared. And what I want to emphasize in this quote right here is that as we are understanding and learning and even teaching that the Sunday Law crisis just ahead of us is a place where we are going to manifest the character that we're now given an opportunity to prepare. Amen. If we're not accepting the reality that our probation closes at the Sunday Law, Amen. then we're not going to be prepared. I guarantee you're not going to be prepared because you're not going to feel the urgency. That's the reason for the prophetic warning message that the disciples received. Jesus told them in advance. And why did He tell them? She says uh, to... The words which they needed to remember were banished from the minds, and when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The warning message was given to prepare them for the time that was coming. Amen. But because they banished it, because they did not allow their heart to truly receive such a cutting truth, such an earth-shattering truth, and this is where we struggle, don't we? Because we, we believe the Sunday law is where probation closes, at least a large majority, the largest majority of Adventists believe. But if we really let our hearts believe that, and we've just had the King of the North come and stand within the confines of the glorious land, planted his standard, and is now going to withdraw. And as it was in 70 AD, when he comes back, it's destruction. Utterly destroyed Jerusalem. And this is a Sunday Law crisis parallel. So what am I saying? I'm simply saying at this point that, friends, we need to allow ourselves to believe that the Sunday Law is just before us. Amen. We need not banish these things from our mind, but let's take hold of the horns of that Amen. bull and know that Christ is there to help us be prepared. Okay? And that's really what we're dealing with in this whole series right now is the work of preparation. Amen. Okay? The covering of Christ and so forth. Now, notice that it said, the, I'll read to you again, she says, the events connected with the close of probation. What are the events? Connected with the close of probation very quickly. The escalation towards sun, the Sunday law. I didn't hear it. Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Right. These are the events. What he says is down in Revelation 22 when he stands up. But the events connected with the close of probation, the close of probation as identified as Daniel 12, 1. So the events that precede that, the verses that precede that, are the events connected with the close of probation. Daniel 11, 40-45 has been given publicly, is out in the public domain on record by many different ministries identifying the final events before Michael stands up that we can become acquainted with. And that study is, you know, uh, very much covered. But then she says, after the events connected with the close of probation, the work of preparation. And that's what I'm really trying to emphasize in this short series. Is that there is a work and this does not imply in any way a works religion, but clearly the language is not employed by me, though I take it up because the Bible and the spirit of prophecy use it. Okay? So there is a work to be done, and she says the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. So we understand Daniel 11, 40 to 45 in most all of our circles, if not the materials out there in the public domain to be acquainted with, to become acquainted with. So now let's look at this, the work of preparation. What I want us to consider is, there's three steps, and this is what we were dealing with before. Acts 3.19 points us to a work of repentance. There's to be a conversion as a result, and then we come to the place where our sins are blotted out. Okay? Now, what I want to identify for us, 
This is step one, this is step two, and this is the final step. This is a three-step process that Christ, in every Reformed history, takes His people through. What we were discovering in parts one and two, we were last dealing with Brother William Miller in the Millerite history. Was he a wise or was he a foolish virgin? We deem that he is a wise virgin because God does not save or guard the precious dust of the foolish virgins. Yet Miller did not have a complete and thorough understanding of the truth for that time because he did not accept April the 19th. He did not accept the midnight cry in its entirety. And he was not standing with that small company after the passing of the time on October the 22nd, 1844. But we see that he's a wise virgin. Now, William Miller, even though he chaired the committee that would oppose or at least contradict the company that were coming through this Millerite history as the wise virgins, yet the angels guard his precious dust. We discover that the reason for this is, is because William Miller had the oil in his lamp and the oil, therefore, was not knowledge. It was not a message, but it was what that message did to him. It was the character in him that resulted from the knowledge that he did know and understand and receive. Amen. Identifying that it isn't a complete knowledge that we all must have of everything that any one man, one ministry, or one organization, or, or one church has. Okay? It's not about how well I know what my wife thinks or how much she knows what, what I think. It's about how much is it, how much information is it that Jesus is going to give me before I get it before I understand, before I fall in love with Christ and give Him my heart. And then as a result, truly, I'm going to have a burden for souls like never before. I'm going to have a love for them that's not born of me, but that's born of the Holy Spirit residing in me. Okay, that's the process. And we were talking about the ends versus the means and so forth. But what I want to do as we start here now, we're going to address these two first parts. Okay, again, dealing with Acts 3.19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out in the times of refreshing. Now, look at with me, well, let's do this. What I want to do now is very simple, because I want to make room for some other things that I've added in. I'm going to read to you now accounts in the spirit of prophecy, and how God uses what I'm identifying as a prophetic warning message that comes at stage one, okay? Always this way is a prophetic <clears throat> warning message. Always. And we're going to see that. I'm going to show you that. Jesus is going to show us that from the Bible. So there is a prophetic warning message. And what I intend to show you is, is it has a limited impact on our transformation of character. Now, I'm careful not to in any way imply that the prophetic warning message at some point gets tossed into the background and is of no more value to us. Never want to imply that. And I'm going to show that to you graphically as we move forward. But right now, let's look at the book of Isaiah, I mean the, the, um, the prophet Isaiah. And I'm reading to you from, as you have it in your handout, 4th Bible Commentary 1149, beginning in paragraph 2. And I read in your hearing, My brethren... You need to study more carefully the 58th chapter of Isaiah. This chapter marks out the only course that we can follow with safety. The prophet receives the word from the Lord. Watch. A message what? Startling, startling in its clearness and force. Now, I'm, what I'm going to start doing here, what is, that? what is it? It is startling. I'm going to start putting this here. And I want us to see the characteristics of what happens when God sends a prophetic warning message. Okay? We're going to look at the tally of these as we move forward. Let's notice now John the Baptist from Review and Herald, April the 3rd, 1894, paragraph 2. The message of John the Baptist was a new and startling message and could not be interwoven with the superstitions and traditions of the Pharisees. Now notice, how many testimonies do we need? Was his message a prophetic warning message? Yes. John the Baptist? Absolutely. What about Isaiah? Yes. He's a prophet of the Lord. Absolutely. Okay, what about Jonah? Okay, let's go to Jonah chapter 3 in your Bible. If you'll turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. And let's read chapter 3 of Jonah. Jonah gives a powerful example 
of how a prophetic warning message is applied. All right, Jonah chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Let's notice now, when God sends a prophetic warning, the process that plays out. Verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, thy great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now, let me ask you, when God gave Jonah the message, did Jonah jump up and say, Oh, praise the Lord, I, I've been wanting to go to them. Lord, I, I'm really looking forward to sharing this message with them. Is that what he did? No. Absolutely not. Do you think there are people in the message today that really don't want to go and share it with other people? But instead, they want them to be destroyed. God have mercy, but there are. Okay, but I'm saying to you that God is an example, is using Jonah as he will use anybody who's willing to go to give that message, even if he has to prod them a little more firmly. Reading on, Arise, verse 2, and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What is that? That's the prophetic warning message. Forty days, brothers, and you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be overthrown. That's the prophetic warning message. Is he telling them in advance? Absolutely. Is he giving them plenty of time for a change of heart? Forty days? That's a lot. Verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God. Why did they believe God? Because He was giving God's message. You see, when we allow the Holy Spirit to use us, if we agree with the Holy Spirit and go where He wants us to go and say what He wants us to say, then it's not our work, it's Christ in us working through us to impact the hearts. And He knew exactly what those people needed to hear and when they needed to hear it. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from the throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let there, that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything less let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Now, the point is, is that a prophetic warning message was given by the servant of God when he finally agreed to do it. As a result, the whole city was converted. Okay? But they were converted because they were first given a prophetic warning message. Now, it's leaving out a whole lot of what transpired with the people personally. But we're just understanding the mechanics that a prophetic warning comes, the people hear it, they are struck to the heart, they're converted. Okay, and I wanna, we're going to detail that process out more. Um, there are some that would grab up at that and say, see, 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 he's just a warning message and they're converted. We're going to see more. We're going to let the spirit of prophecy speak in every way. We're not going to bind her up. Taken from Conflict and Courage, page 230, paragraph 5. Speaking of this situation with Jonah, once more the servant of God was commissioned to warn Nineveh. Uh, as Jonah entered the city, he began at once to cry against the, the, it the message, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. From street to street he went, sounding the note of warning. Look, this is a warning message. What I'm saying to you is, is that God first sends a warning message. And was it startling to the Ninevites? Of course. Absolutely. Forty days and we'll be dead? Wouldn't that be startling? In the Millerite history, 1843? You think that was startling? Absolutely. The message was not in vain. The cry that rang through the streets of the godless city was passed from lip to lip until all the inhabitants had heard the startling announcement. The Spirit of God pressed the message home to every heart. And what? Caused. What, what caused? Holy the message of the Spirit. Spirit. Ah. So the words themselves don't do anything unless the Spirit of God is allowed to impress them upon the heart. Now, who opens the door of the heart? The Word? Does the Word kick the door in and just come on in? No. No, we have a part. So the Word will do nothing unless I open the door of my heart and say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. 
I want, I want to know what's truth. I'm willing to face who I really am, and I'm praying for your power and strength to overcome. Notice, the Spirit of God pressed the message home to every heart and caused multitudes to tremble because of their sins. And what? To repent. So repentance is part of this process. That's what it says. The Spirit of God takes the warning message and begins to apply it to the heart. And for those that Sister White says there's either honest or dishonest souls in the church today. And she says every truly honest soul will come to the light of truth in Great Controversy 521. Every truly honest soul will come to the light of truth. And the warning message is the light of truth. Okay? So the honest are going to be cut to the heart. They're going to be awakened. They're going to see. But let's read on. She says, Cause multitudes to tremble because of their sin and to repent in deep humiliation. Their doom was averted. The God of Israel was exalted and honored throughout the heathen world and His law was revered. So this is the impact that Jonah's message had. So there's three testimonies. And how many do we need? Two. Okay? But let's go on. Let's look at Solomon. Solomon has quite a record to share with us. This is from, again, Conflict and Courage, but page 196, paragraph 4. By his own bitter experience, Solomon learned the emptiness of a life that seeks in earthly things its highest good. He erected altars to heathen gods, only to learn how in vain their promise of rest to the Spirit. Gloomy and soul-harassing thoughts troubled him night and day. For him there was no longer any joy of life or peace of mind, and the future was dark with despair. Yet the Lord forsook him not, Praise the Lord. By messages of reproof. Now I want you to see something. In Leviticus 26, does God say, you break my commandment, I'm scattering you off the land right away. Is that what He did? You'll discover that there, is, there are warnings that are giving. There are things that He says He will do leading up to verse 20, 21, where He's going to scatter them off the land. When He says, and yet for all this, if you will not turn and keep my commandments, I will scatter you off the land. There are, there are warnings and reproofs that we are all given. Let's bring this personal and practical. In, your, in the course of life every day, you are given warnings by God. It's your responsibility to be prayerful and eyes wide open, searching to know what God's will is for you and what has to be changed. And you can know that God is going to be faithful to show it to you in a very tender and uh, palatable way, if I could say it that way. Yet the Lord forsook him not by messengers of reproof and by severe judgments. He sought to arouse the king to a realization of the sinfulness of his course. Do you think God wants us to see that today? Do you think He wants us to see the sinfulness of our course? Amen. At last the Lord through a prophet delivered to Solomon the startling message. Okay, so clearly we know that the prophetic warning message is a startling message. What, what does startle mean? Wake up. That means you were asleep, right? To startle awake is to wake suddenly, is to startle you. It's to alar alarm you, uh, put you on guard quickly. Okay, praise the Lord for the warning message. Laodicea needs that, don't they? Don't we? I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give to thy servant notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Now awakened, now listen, he's awakened now. This warning message has awakened him. We're looking here now at the, the effects of a prophetic warning message. Okay? Awakened as from a dream by his sentence of judgment pronounced against him. What was it when God gave him the understanding in advance that his kingdom was going to be rent from him and divided. That was a prophetic warning message. Okay? Solomon was told in advance what was to come. This is the prophetic warning message. Chastened in spirit, with mind and body enfeebled. Follow this now. He what? You follow me? No, I'm not hearing you. Okay, so you, you got to see this. This is very important. The story of Solomon is given as testimony as to how the prophetic warning message impacts God's people as God designed it. So let's take, let's take notice here. Chastened in spirit, with mind 
and body enfeebled, he turned, we wrote, he turned wearied and thirsting from earth's broken cisterns to drink once more at the fountain of life. So what happens? Turn. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Turn from life's... Um, he, he turned wearied and thirsting from the earth's broken cisterns to drink once more at the fountain of life. He could never hope to escape the blasting results of sin. He could never free his mind from all remembrance of the self-indulgent course he had been pursuing. But he would endeavor earnestly to do what? Dissuade. To dissuade others from following after following. In other words, one of the byproducts of the warning message, once you get it, once you turn from your follies, is to do what? Save other souls. This is a byproduct of of Christ's love residing in your heart. Amen. So what am I saying? I'm saying that if you're dealing with people who do not have a burden for souls that are involved in ministry, but have no burden for souls, I mean personal interest in souls, you have reason to fear. These, these brothers and sisters are not fully turned from the world yet. Because you're going to see, and I'll show you another example among these testimonies, that when we turn from this world, when we truly turn from this world, we turn to face the Son of Righteousness. Amen. And we cannot help but be filled with His love Amen. for the souls for whom He died. And we may read some of those quotes here today. I want to read to you now from Noah. Okay, Noah gives a powerful testimony. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man in our day. Okay, so Noah's time is prefiguring our time. Let's watch this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24... And notice verse 37, Matthew 24. And what verse? 37. Verse 37. <clears throat> Verses 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now notice what Sister White, after quoting those verses, notice what she says here, and this is taken from Christ Object Lessons, page 228, paragraph 1. I'm sorry, paragraph 2. So it is today. Men are rushing on in the chase for gain and selfish indulgence, as if there were no God, no heaven, and no hereafter. In Noah's day, the warning of the flood was sent to startle men in their wickedness and call them to repentance. So the message of Christ's soon coming is designed to arouse men from their absorption in worldly things. Now, let's notice what's happening, because see, the, there's a call to repentance, okay, that's in this message. Call to repent. That's what we're understanding from this message. It's to startle men in their wickedness and call them to repentance. So the message of Christ's soon coming. Are we preaching the soon coming of Christ? Are we, is that our message? Amen. Amen. It is. At the Sunday law, even closer than most would think. Door probation closes for Adventists there. So the message of Christ's soon coming is designed to arouse men from their absorption in worldly things. It is intended to, there it is, it's already up there. Awaken them to a sense of eternal realities that they may give heed to the invitation to the Lord's table. The gospel invitation is to be given to all the world. Quote, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Revelation 14, 6. The last message of warning and mercy is to lighten the whole earth with its glory. It is to reach all classes of men, rich and poor, high and low. Go out into the highways and hedges, Christ says, and what? Compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. So here's your second witness to what happens when you receive the startling message and when you are roused from your absorption in worldly things, when you're awakened to a sense of eternal realities, when you yield to the invitation to the Lord's table, and then what happens it says, 
you're going to compel them to come in. You see, this is what is missing for so many of us. Oh man, we can, we can talk this message. We know the prophetic warning message inside and out. But we really don't know Jesus Christ personally. We don't know what it is to not have a dime and not know where what's coming from next. We're not daily living, trusting and depending on Christ for understanding, for wisdom, for His leading. We're not laying our plans before Him when we wake up in the morning. We're just going through and plowing ahead because we think we know what's best for us each day. But in all our ways, we're to acknowledge Him and let Him direct our paths. And here, friends, at the end of the world, when it is so crucial that you and I are where we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be there, because God is leading, yet we're over here. And maybe souls are lost because we're not following as the Lord is leading. What I want us to see in this as a second testimony is that when we accept the fact that Jesus is coming is imminent, this is the beginning of, this is the list that begins to form of the things that this message does do. Okay, it startles us, causes us to repent. It awakens us as a Laodicean to the sense of our true sinful condition. We turn from this world. We realize, as did Solomon, that these broken cisterns have nothing to offer me. And we give the call to repentance, plus we're called to repentance. But reading on, we're not done yet. Notice this. This is a very sad epitaph to those here at this time in history that are prefigured by this quote of those who were in, in uh, Noah's day. This is taken from The Advocate, December the 1st, 1900, paragraph 1. Calamities, earthquakes, and floods, disasters by land and by sea, will increase. God is looking upon the world today as He looked upon it in Noah's time. He is sending His message to people today as He sent it in the days of Noah. There is in this age of the world a repetition of the wickedness of the world before the flood. Many, now that's her day. What do you think she'd say about today? And here this young person went, walked right into a school in Oregon recently, a community college, and shot all the people that he shot. And she thinks that it was wicked in her day. Many helped Noah build the ark. All right, what's the ark? A safe place. A That's a place of refuge. That's the place of refuge. All right. But they're helping him labor to build the ark. They, they look... Now listen, you've got to realize something. When God said, Noah, build that ark, what was he really saying? What was, what was Noah doing or saying back to God by building that ark? They trusted obedience. You're, you're real close. He trusted. He had faith in God. He lived his faith. God, you said build it. I've never seen rain come out of the sky, Lord. But you're saying build it. I'm going to believe you. And I'm going to trust in you. And I'm going to exercise that trust by way of showing you in faith that I believe that I'm going to start building this ark. Okay, the same thing with the man who built his house upon the rock. He believed the rains and winds and flood were coming. He began to build the house. He prepared for something he hadn't seen yet. All right? But here, what I want us to see is, is that these people are helping Noah build the ark. So they're, they're outwardly, they look like they are men of faith, women of faith. But watch what she says. Many helped Noah build the ark who did not believe the startling message. Who did not cleanse themselves from all wrong principles. Who did not overcome the temptation to do and say things which were entirely contrary to the mind and will of God. They weren't overcomers, friends. Is that going to be you and I? Are you helping to build the ark today? Are you out there with hammer and nail? Are you pounding the pavement? Are you handing out books? Are you hitting the streets and doing this and doing that? But are you really building the ark for the right reasons? Because you see, we've got to believe the startling message. And that startling message is that Christ's coming is imminent. Amen. And even sooner for Adventists, because the Sunday Law is where we're going to manifest any work we're able to get done right now, or that Christ is able to do in us, I should say. Okay, so, well, we can't end there. We've got to go to the last church as recorded in the Bible. So I'm going to take you to... Hmm, I don't have the reference for this. Somebody would look this up. I'm going to pencil it in. 
Um, I'll give you the first few words. Well, you, you that have the handouts, all of you have handouts, look up this quote and tell me what the reference is. I'll go on and read this, and someone can look that up. The message to the church of the Laodiceans is a startling denunciation and is applicable to the people of God at the present time. Could somebody open this side door, if you would? And uh, Brother Tom, would you tell me the time count on that so I'll know when to end? I didn't take note in the beginning. Reading this again, the message to the church of the Laodiceans is a startling denunciation and is applicable to the people of God at the present time. So again, brothers and sisters, here we are at the end of the world and we're giving a startling message as the church of Laodicea and it's supposed to have this impact upon us and we move forward from that. 35? Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Going, going on reading this quote, What greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are wrong? The message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception, yet honest in that deception. They know not that their condition is deplorable in the sight of God. While those addressed are flattering themselves that they are in an exalted spiritual condition, the message of the true witness breaks their security by the startling denunciation of their true condition of spiritual blindness, poverty, and wretchedness. This, the testimony so cutting and severe cannot be a mistake, for it is the true... That got cut off. I don't know how that got cut off. But I know how it goes, and it's, it's not pertinent to what we were just reading. My point is, as the church of Laodicea, we too are receiving a startling message. A startling denunciation, as it's said. Friends, you and I don't realize, most of us, that we're poor, blind, wretched. Poor, blind, wretched, naked. And friends, we have to overcome this. What we have to understand is that the prophetic warning message is given at the first stage of reform or the glorious manifestation of the power of God begins with a warning message that is calculated to startle us because we're asleep in a Laodicean condition. And in every reform history, there's a period of darkness or spiritual slumber. Okay? There's a startling that occurs. And as we see this, there's a repentance involved. When we awaken to our true sinful condition, as we see here awakened, we turn from this world, we seek Christ. And there's a call to repentance very quickly. I may have mentioned this prior to now. I'm not sure if I did. Matthew chapter 2, the wise men, they go looking for the baby boy Jesus. Why? Because they read it in the Enquirer? How did they know? Studied prophecies. They were studying the prophecies. They saw the prophetic warning message and they weren't even Gentiles. So they see the prophetic warning message and in pure faith, they grab up a bunch of gold, some priceless myrrh and frankincense, and they head across the country. Greatest exercising of faith. Sister White, when she writes about these three men, she says there's no, she parallels it to the man uh, where Christ says of the centurion, I've seen no greater faith in all of Israel. That's what she says about these three men. Faith. Now what I'm saying to you is, is that they saw the prophetic warning message. They knew that Christ was coming. And in response to it, they go in search of Christ. And I'm saying to you that today, as God has sent us a prophetic warning message, it causes us to go in search of Christ. And in search of Christ, where do we find Christ? Where do we find the Lamb today? Right? We're to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. Where are we going to find the Lamb? Present truth. Sanctuary. Present truth. Sanctuary. That's closer. None of these are necessarily wrong. But where do we see Christ today? What's His work? He's in the most holy place. What is He there in the most holy? What is He to us in the most holy place? He is. He's our mediator. Why is He our mediator? Intercessor. He's intercessor. Why? What gives Him that right? Because He died for us. He died for us. Where is Jesus? In Hebrews, He died once for all. Jesus is the Lamb of God. When we follow the Lamb, 
We follow Him right to the foot of the cross because this is where we behold Christ today on our behalf. I know He's in the most holy place, but you have to understand, His blood is interceding for us. I'm not saying He's still up on the cross. But by beholding Him there, we understand, Sister White will tell us, His role for us today as our mediator and as the, as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's imperative that we see that. That's not discussed anymore today. We're just talking prophecy. We're talking about the soon coming, the destruction, the mayhem, the fearful woes and lamentations. And that's where we end our message. And we wonder why it's not drawing anyone near us. We have to understand that our message needs to be balanced. Okay? I'll come to that. Um, I want to touch on that more. It was 3T. Oh, okay. The reference for that was Testimonies, Volume 3. 3T, page 252, paragraph 252, paragraph 4. Right. Okay. 3T, 252, paragraph 4. Okay. Now, why, what other impact, when God sends this prophetic warning message, remember what I'm saying to you is, is that one of the byproducts of it is that when we turn from this, from this world and our lifestyle and we turn in search of Christ, one of the natural byproducts that's going to occur in our heart and in our mind is that we want to seek and save the loss that Jesus died for. We realize that this is our first work. We're going to come to that too as the Lord allows. Let's go to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And the question I want to answer is why? That's synonymous with the first work. Amen. Amen. The first works is connected inseparably to the first love. Amen. And we're going to touch on that today by God's grace. Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Joel is the prophet writing about the end of the world and he's writing about those things in order for you and I to understand our role at the end of the world. And notice what he says. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. And sound an alarm where? In my holy, in my holy mountain. I, you can't blow the trumpet in Zion. You can't sound an alarm in His holy mountain unless you go into these places. His mountain. Into Zion. This is God's church. This is His people. Not, not just a physical structure, but to go in among those that Jesus died for and to have a genuine burden for their souls as Jesus did. That's what our commission is. And why are we to go there? To play the harp? What does it say? Why are we to go there? To give the prophetic warning message. Play the guitar for them? What does it say? Blow. What are we supposed to do when we get there? Blow. We're to blow the trumpet. In the trumpet, there's nothing about a trumpet that lulls you to sleep, is it? You can't, you can't drift off to sleep real peaceful with a trumpet playing, can you? The trumpet is startling. It's the message. It's the message of warning of the soon shut door for Adventists at the Sunday Law, Ezekiel 9. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. You and I have to realize that once we understand this warning of Christ's imminent coming, we are to allow it to transform who we are, to change our thinking. It doesn't change our character yet, but it changes our direction, points us back to the foot of the cross, sends us in search of Christ, and we're going to detail here in a moment how this process works once the startling warning message comes. Love and power. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3, quickly if you will. I just want to make this powerful point about the warning message that we are given. Um, I, Ezekiel chapter... Three, but let, hold your finger there. There's one other verse I'm impressed to read right now in John 14. If you'll hold your finger there and come to John, I believe it's John 14. 16, uh, 16 verse 14. Yes, thank you. John 16, verse 14. Now this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And notice what the Holy Spirit does. It says, He shall glorify me, Jesus is speaking, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Do you think we're going to do any less? We're going to receive of the Father and we're going to show it unto you. That's what we do. Amen. Okay, so now back in Ezekiel. Ezekiel's living testimony of this very principle. 
in chapter 3, verse 17, Christ comes to Ezekiel and He says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. See, we're going to Zion, brothers and sisters, and there's a reason. We're going to look at why. In part, it's because we are to be saviors to these people. Look that word up in the Bible. You'll discover that Sister White in the Bible will confirm that we are to be saviors. We're to be like Christ, and through our giving of the life-saving message, become saviors on behalf of Christ. Truly, Christ is our only Savior. And I'll bring that quote forward at another time. But notice what it says here. When I say unto the wicked, verse 18, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. If you're refusing to go and share this with anybody that God gives you opportunity to, and of course you want to know that it's God's leading. But if you refuse to do this work, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall surely die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You've got to warn people. Number one, you're going to want to warn them because you have a true burden for their souls. But in doing that, you're simultaneously going to secure for yourself that the blood is not on your hands. And we have to realize our commission, once we hear the prophetic warning message, as it begins to impact us, we now have to go before God and ask, Lord, give me a divine appointment. Show me who you want me to minister to. I don't know everything, Lord, but I'll share what I do know, no matter how limited it is. Um, Colossians chapter 1. And we'll see, this, see the results of this in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, notice verse 27 and verse 28. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. What, what is this message of Christ in you, the hope of glory? What, what is that message? That's the everlasting gospel. It's the good news about Jesus Christ and His victory over sin on our behalf, and that through faith He can be formed within as we venture out upon His promises and take Him at His word, he will meet us there and will grant us a greater faith. This is the mystery of godliness. There is the mystery of iniquity, but this is the mystery of godliness. Reading again verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, why? That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Your warning of these souls, brothers and sisters, is to present them perfect in Christ Jesus. But if we're not warning, their blood is going to be on our hands. Okay? Now, as you turn the page, we come to a section that I've got a few minutes to identify. And I want to draw this out on the board for you. Okay? What I've been saying up until this point, I want to draw it out now in a visual way. So I'm going to draw it as it is on your paper. And for those that would get this handout later, I want to show it to you this way. Now I want to put certain things in place. This is prophetic. It's smaller, so the camera might not see it as well. Prophetic warning. Okay? This marks the beginning or the arrival of the prophetic warning in my Christian experience. Okay, this is not at a date and time, but this is identifying in mine and anybody else's when the prophetic warning message strikes home and you realize, hey, Jesus is coming soon. Okay, this is the wake up to that reality. Then what I want us to see is that the other end of this is representing the blotting out. I'm just going to leave it as blotting out. The blotting out of sin in our life. This is the National Sunday Law. Okay? Now, 
Let me be clear, just for those who would see this and don't understand what I mean when I put it this way. I understand that at the National Sunday Law, where our character, where the stamp is impressed, and we read earlier where our characters remain pure and spotless for eternity, that at the Sunday Law, this process of God's people being sealed is progressive. It begins in America. Then the, Satan comes down empowering the false message of apostate Protestantism in America, saying the Sunday is sacred. Those in America who are in the Adventist church and out of the Adventist church who have not received the love for the truth are going to receive strong delusion and are going to believe that lie, that Sunday is sacred. They're going to believe that lie. And then from there, the whole world is going to wander after the beast. Therefore, the whole world is going to, like dominoes, have their Sunday law. And that process will play out and play out and play out and play out and play out until the last nation on this globe has had its Sunday law. The test has been put to God's people and the two classes made manifest. And then the angel flies his way up to Jesus and says, I am finished. And Jesus stands up and says, it's done. It's over. It's finished. So there's a sealing process but it begins in America at the Sunday Law test when it arrives. And people say, oh, brother, I've got time, but you've got until the next Saturday or Sunday to make your decision. That's what you have. That's how much time you have. Okay? And yes, penalties, fines, and so forth increasing. That's a whole other study. But the point is this. At the Sunday Law, she says the line is drawn in the sand. She says the door is closed to those who would not enter while His hand of mercy is still stretched out to save those who have had no opportunity to learn what is true for this time. Okay, so there's a shut door right here, friends, and we need to realize this. Okay, this is a period of history now between, I'm going to identify this as 9-11 and National Sunday Law. Okay? Now here's what I want us to see. I hope to be able to show by God's grace. I want to read this quote to you. It's in your paper. And it's taken from Review and Herald, November the 4th, 1890. And it begins in paragraph 2, I believe. Three. Well, 3, but it's broken up there. So, so it's say 2 or 3. Um, again, Review and Herald, November the 4th, 1890, paragraph 3, paragraph 2 is where I suggest you start looking. This is the conversion process. Some have used the term supernatural. You just eat God's Word and you're going to have a supernatural experience and one day you're going to have the character God is going to have formed it in you unbeknownst to you. And ap apparently indicating through this statement that by no effort on your own part of putting away sin will this happen. Okay, that's a very... Very gross darkness. But let me make this point. From 9-11 until the National Sunday Law, God in His mercy is sending us the latter rain. What I want you to see is this is representing our Christian experience. Okay? And I want to read to you this conversion process as it's detailed here. I, I, I praise the Lord when I came across this didn't even initially understand what, how powerful this was I was looking at. But let's look at the language and unmistakable identification of this process of conversion. And this is the point I wanted to make. That's why I walked over here earlier. Friends, this right here, anybody who is having this experience right here from 9-11 forward, somewhere in your experience where you awakened to that prophetic warning message and realize Christ's coming is imminent and God is doing what He's doing. Amen. When you realize that, you started having this Amen. encounter. Amen. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are those that feel that this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. They think this is all there is to it. That th This right here, because I, I feel a need to repent, I've been awakened to my true sinful condition, I'm turning from the world, I'm, I'm, I'm called to repentance, and I'm calling others to repentance, and it's, it startled me. They think this is what it is that will produce the character. Only in part, friends, only in part. If there is a flight of stairs from here to the next floor, and there's 37 steps in them, and I tell you, well... The first 30 are missing, but go ahead and go on up there. You're saying, wait a minute, I, I, I've, I've got to have the other 30 steps. Come on, where, where are they at? Friends, you can't get to the second floor 
unless you take the whole process Amen. because here's the second floor. Okay, you can't get there if you take this section of the staircase out. And my point is this, these events, these things that occur and that are resulting from our accepting of the warning message, amen, praise the Lord. But this is part of the journey. This is the springboard that sets your feet in the right path, points you to the foot of the cross, has you going in search of Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Okay? We need to get moving. But those that are standing here and saying, man, I am having a powerful experience, don't understand what God is wanting to do in our characters. Listen, our faces are going to glow as did Moses. We've got to get into the second phase of this and start allowing Jesus to totally give us power and victory over every sin through surrender of ourselves and our hearts and our minds and through an earnest battle. Look those words up in the Spirit of Prophecy. It's a battle, brothers and sisters. It's not a sit back, read your way to heaven. That's a works-oriented message. That's, a, that's salvation by works. I'm going to read my way right in there, Jesus. Move over. I'm going to know all of this. And I'm trusting you're just going to do something in me. Jesus says, I'm sorry, my son, my daughter, but you're going to be left standing outside the city unless you take up the work she says that lies at your own feet. And that's your own salvation. Notice this now. I'm going to read this to you. And these are not my words. Okay? There is no salvation without repentance. There it is. First step. There is no salvation without repentance. Praise the Lord. Now you know why we need the prophetic warning message. And let me say that this line here represents the prophetic warning message. I'm going to do that as this. All right? That's what this line represents. The warning message, okay? From here all the way through, this is our experience. And I'm putting it this way because I want you to understand that I'm not saying we need to do away with our prophetic warning message. Do you know why we don't need to get rid of it? Why we cannot get rid of it? Because it causes this to remain with us day by day. Day by day, when you understand the prophetic warning message, it is a catalyst to keep you next to Jesus. It is what keeps you focused on what you must be doing. It is the power, amen, that's going to keep you at the foot of the cross. Otherwise, you just become Laodicea all over again. Okay? Now watch. No impenitent sinner can believe with his heart unto righteousness. Repentance is described by Paul as a godly sorrow for sin that worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. This repentance has in it nothing of the nature of merit, but it prepares. Uh oh, something's coming later. See, this right here is preparing you and I for something. It prepares the heart for the acceptance of Christ as the only Savior, the only hope of the lost sinner. Listen, right here is where Christ bringing that prophetic warning message. He's preparing you to receive something that's coming. And He just told you what it was. To receive Christ as the only Savior, the only hope of the lost sinner. You see, brothers and sisters, we need hope, don't we? When the prophetic warning message startles us, causes us to repent, awakens us to our true sinful condition, what do we need? We need hope. We don't have hope in that. That in itself is not hope. That's why in Ezekiel chapter 2, it's fearful lamentations and woes. Because it's meant to startle you. It's meant to jerk you out of your self-confidence and help you to see that you need a Savior. That's why He's called a Savior. Because you can't save yourself. And we have to have Him. So, the warning begins a process. Here it is. As this is happening, you're awakened and it's preparing you to receive something else. But now watch this. This is the next paragraph, paragraph 3. As the sinner looks to the law, his guilt is made plain to him and, he, and pressed home to his conscience and he is condemned. Now, why are, how is this prophetic warning message making me look to the law? One of the components 
the strong central themes of the warning message is judgment, isn't it? How are we judged? We're judged by the law. The law is our judge, is it not? Is it not the mirror that when we look into it, oh man, we see the sin in our life. We see where we fall short. And that's what Jesus is doing by sending a judgment message. Right here, the judgment message. His only comfort, okay, warning message, God says, listen, but you gotta have comfort. And see, what we've been doing is we've been giving a warning message with no comfort whatsoever. She goes on and says, the only comfort of hope is found in looking to the cross of Calvary. That's your only comfort. So here's what I want to draw in. I'm drawing it right there for a reason. What I want to show you is it's in this place somewhere here after we have received the warning message now follow this we receive the warning message we have this experience transformation of mind and heart begin to occur meaning be very clear on this it's not saying all of a sudden I'm Christ like it's not saying I'm even being Christ like it's saying that I'm coming to the place where I realize that I have to repent first off I see myself as a sinner Second off, I realize that unless I repent, I am lost. But my heart goes out to God. I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But I'm a sinner. This is the valley that we're in. We receive the prophetic warning message, but something begins to happen. Yes, the Holy Spirit is working upon our hearts. But what He's doing is He's pointing us to Jesus. Let me read it again for you. His only comfort and hope is found in looking to the cross of Calvary as He ventures upon the promises. What does that mean? That means as He determines to take God at His word, the promise is, I'm going to believe that. As He ventures upon His promises, taking God at His word, relief and peace come to, this, to His soul. He cries, Lord, Thou hast promised to save all who come unto Thee in the name of Thy Son. I am a lost, helpless, hopeless soul. Lord, save, or I perish. His faith lays hold on Christ and He is what? Justified. He's justified before God. Right here. The end of that paragraph is right here. That's where it occurs. This is where the transition occurs in our Christian experience. God sends us a prophetic warning message. Actually, I meant to draw that in red. Because I want there to be a, a distinction. When the prophetic warning message comes, the very first thing that it does is listed here in this list. As I am awakened, now I begin to grapple with the reality of who I am. God is now showing me the sin in my life because He's holding before me judgment. And He's saying, west of the door, it's going to be closing in the near future. And if you aren't ready, looking again, if you aren't ready, I can't take you with me. You're going to be lost eternally lost. You'll never see those that have gone on before you. As I begin to wrestle with that, I become awakened. I, I want to turn. There's a process of development, of transforming of desires and wants. And only thing that can help me in my disparaging realization is to look and live. That's why when we've been giving this warning message, God have mercy on us, brothers and sisters, we are not pointing the people to Jesus upon that cross intentionally, she says. Our gospel needs to be balanced. It needs to have both justice and mercy. Okay? Amen. We've got to have that. There's a call to repentance that we need to answer. I see. I see. That we need to answer. Okay? When we turn from our selfish ways, when we fall upon that rock and are broken, that's happening in this process. And so many are thinking that, hey, right here, I'm having all this happen. That's where it's at. I I'm, I'm, I'm awakened. I see things like I've never seen. They're not understanding this is the beginning of the journey. This is the turning of your heart and mind away from the world and focusing it upon Christ Jesus. Amen. Because by beholding 
we become transformed into the same image from glory to glory. If we're not beholding Jesus and all we see is that law held in front of us and the mention of the shut door in the very imminent future, brothers and sisters, it is a horrifying experience and it's easy to turn away from that. Do you follow me? It's easy to reject those that teach that way. What we need to bring is hope to our message of gloom and doom. Amen. And if we don't, we're going to be responsible for the souls that we have pushed away from Christ. God have mercy if we think otherwise. Now I want to read to you more. This is, this is, we're just getting started here. I want you to notice what she says. I'll read it again. As the sinner looks to the law, his guilt is made plain to him and pressed home to his conscience. And he is condemned. Okay, that's what happens. The prophetic warning message causes you to look at the law, points to you that the door is about to shut and judgment will be dealt, dealt upon you. She says, His only comfort and hope is found in looking to the cross of Calvary. As he ventures upon the promises, taking God at His word, relief and peace come to his soul. He cries, Lord, Thou hast promised to save all who come unto Thee in the name of Thy Son. That's what he's saying right here. Right here. Because it's here where he's beginning to look to Christ. And he's not despairing anymore. He's drawing hope and strength from the fact that Christ has promised him and he calls to God in faith. This is righteousness by faith, brothers and sisters. Amen. Looking to Calvary as he ventures upon the promises, taking God at his word, relief and peace come to his soul. He cries, Lord, thou hast promised to save all who come unto thee in the name of thy son. I am a lost, helpless, hopeless soul. Lord, save or I perish. And what do you think Jesus does? What did he do to Peter? Reach out. Lord, save. <laughs> Instantly, Sister White says, if you go back to the Zyre Ages, instantly Christ reached out. He was there. Instantly. Jesus doesn't tally, uh, tarry long. His faith lays hold on Christ and He is justified before God. Right here, justified. Now this is, I drew this in because this is a transitional point for you and I from being, receiving, working, uh, God working repentance in us through this prophetic warning to there being a conversion. Somewhere in here there's a conversion process that occurs and it brings us to the point where when the Sunday law arrives, our sins are able to be blotted out. But make no mistake about it. Your sins are not going anywhere unless you're involved in the work of overcoming. Okay? If you're not overcoming, you're not overcoming. You're lost. And overcoming does not mean overcoming the latest series and understanding the latest series. Mine or anybody's. The overcoming is about overcoming that defect in character. You see, what's offensive to God is our disobedience, our self-will. It's not that we missed our turn. It's not that we, you know, stumbled over a root. This is not the perfection Christ is after. He wants so that your heart is free of every defilement, of every selfish act. Every selfish act. Reading on. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. Okay, these are the requirements now. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active, living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So here it is. This is what I said now. You're building the ark in here, okay? You're building the house. You've got the foundation laid. Now you need to build the house. Now you need to build the ark. Right? Didn't Noah lay the whole structure of the boat first before he began to skin it out? The foundation of that ark was the framework. We need to be building our character right now. And our character being built is connected with faith. And how does the faith work? Faith that works by love. What does that mean? That means, Lord, when you tell me that you're going to flood this earth and I've never seen rain in my life, ever, never heard of it, but you're telling me you're going to flood this earth with fire, I mean with, with water and destroy everybody on it, well, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to believe you and I'm going to show you that I'm going to believe you because I'm going to start building the ark. I'm going to start developing the character. I asked this question earlier today at church I spoke at, so let me ask you this. What do you think was more ridiculous? That they were going to build an ark in Noah's day when there had never been rain, never even been a flood, no surges of water of any kind. 
than Noah's building this massive ark, or today to stand here and tell people that we have to have a character free of sin. Which do you think is more ridiculous, more preposterous? They're equal, friends. It's the same thing. Today, God's not saying, build me an ark. He's saying, build me a character. Okay? Build me a character. Because that's your shelter in the coming storm. And I want you to build it before the world as a testimony of your faith in me. That you believe that my coming is soon. Do you get it? Amen. We need to show the world that we believe in what we preach and what we teach. Amen. And we do it by developing, forgive me, Father, by allowing Christ to develop within us His character through surrender of our will. That's simple. Not my will, Father, but Thy will. Through the surrender of my will, moment by moment, I'm able to overcome. Now I want to close this out with this next paragraph. Um, without the grace of Christ, now we're going to qualify grace in, in just a moment. In fact, let me do that now. Lift Him up. LHU 266, paragraph 3. says, There must be a deep work of grace, the love of God in the heart. What is grace? It's the love of God in the heart. Okay? And this love is expressed by obedience, the quote says. So let me go back to this paragraph. Without the grace of Christ, which is the love of God in the heart, which out, without the grace of Christ, without the love of God in the heart, the sinner is in a hopeless condition. Come on now. Listen. If love is a four-letter word to you, if you think it's sick sentimentalism, then you don't know Jesus Christ. Because herein is love. What love is this that our God would lay down His life for man? Amen. This is love. And it's not just a sanctified decision as somebody want to clinically describe it. Though that is a component of love, God's love, our love. But what I want you to see and understand is, is that the love in the heart is a principle, yes, that God puts within us. And that love, it's power. That's what Jesus says through the Spirit of Prophecy. She says, without the grace of Christ, without the love of God in the heart, the sinner is in a hopeless condition. Nothing can be done for him. But through divine grace, the love of God in the heart, supernatural power is imparted to the man. What is the supernatural power? Based on that quote, what's the supernatural power? The love of God in the heart. Come on, do you see that? So when we're saying that there's some supernatural work that's going to happen, understand that it's God's love in the heart that does that. Does that just come in? No, we have to surrender. We have to surrender our will. There's a work to be done, brothers and sisters, of dying to self. Amen. I want this, but Jesus says it's not good for me. I refuse to do it. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep fighting. Through the divine grace, supernatural power is imparted to the man. The supernatural power that's imparted to him is the love of God in the heart. And you can find, run this in her writings, love is power. Okay, love is power. It's not just a decision. Love is power, Sister White will tell us. Out of there, please. Out of there. Supernatural power is imparted to the man and works in mind and heart and character. It is through the impartation of the grace of Christ or the love of God in the heart that sin is discerned in its hateful nature and finally driven from the soul temple. Do you realize that the love of Christ, how starkly contrasted it is to the selfishness of Satan and sin? See, when God puts love into our hearts, what He's doing is He is contrasting His character against the nature and character of this world. And we see sin and it's repulsiveness. The reason we don't see the sinfulness of sin today is because we still sin. And we're not really fighting like we should. We're not overcoming. But as we allow the love of Christ truly to come into our hearts, brothers and sisters, there are things that are going to be so offensive to us that others are going to say, come on, brother, that's nothing. That's, what is that? We need the love of Christ in our hearts. Amen. Wanting to finish this paragraph here, she says, It is through grace that we are brought into fellowship. Wait, come on now. It is through the love of God in the heart that we are brought into fellowship with Christ to be associated with Him in the work of salvation. His love in us 
drives us to seek out those which are lost. It's just a natural byproduct. When the sinner believes that Christ is his personal Savior, then, according to his unfailing promises, God pardons his sins and justifies him freely. The repentant soul realizes that his justification comes because Christ, as his substitute and surety, has died for him, is his atonement and righteousness. Okay, summary. Prophetic warning message comes into your experience. And brothers and sisters, you're startled awake. You're startled awake. And you're shown your sins and you turn from this world. The law of God is held up to you because judgment is pronounced upon those in the near future. You turn from this wicked world and you repent. And I'm not talking about a repentance of the world as we read at the beginning, but a repentance that need not be repented of. A true sorrow for sin. When that happens now, you're going to be like the wise men and you're going to go in search of Jesus Christ. You're going to follow the Lamb, whithersoever He goeth. And brothers and sisters, where did the Lamb end up? He ended up on the cross. You're going to be led right to the foot of the cross where you're going to look up and you're going to behold the greatest love that this, this whole universe has ever seen and ever known and still does not understand. And it's by beholding that love, that tender mercy, that unwarranted favor of God. And we know how wicked we are. To think that He still loves me and that He sent His Son for me, this is where we are justified as we accept the promises of God that He is able to present us faultless. To believe in His Word. And here begins the journey of victory. Oh, it's not a pleasant one. It's not an easy one. But it is one nonetheless. It's our trek to the sea of glass. Brothers and sisters, may God help us. Help us to understand that prophecy has, by the way, the whole time, as I said earlier, the prophetic warning message is right here in our hip pocket. Because the prophetic warning message is ever telling me in the back of my mind, you don't have time to play around with sin. You don't have time. Remember the evidences of my soon coming? That's why we can never do away with it. And it's the foundation of our faith in Christ's soon appearing. We begin our trek, brothers and sisters, in order that our sins may be blotted out. That by the time we arrive here, Christ, through our surrender, will have achieved something within us. Yes, that is supernatural. But that supernatural is the love of God that is only obtained as we behold Christ upon the cross. A prophetic warning does not bring the love and warm fuzzies, friends. It's, it is something that we just read warrants that we need hope because it can be disparaging. May God help us to understand the limited role of prophecy or the warning message. No matter how elaborate it may be, no matter how intricate and detailed it may be, no matter how fascinating it may be, guess what? It is still just a prophetic warning. It's just warning you. So the real question is, are you going to receive the warning and begin the work of building the house? That's the question. Shall we pray? Our Holy Father in Heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in Heaven. Kind and merciful Father, in this time of the glorious manifestation of the power of God among us now as a people, may our eyes be opened wide, Father. May our heart door be flung wide open that we might receive the true grace, the love of God in the heart that we might begin to see victories in our life. We can't see the sinfulness of sin unless we have that love in our hearts, Father. We will still see sin as not so bad. Loving Father in heaven, send your holy angels. Send all that is necessary to save us from ourselves. Send your Holy Spirit. And fill us, Father, with that self-sacrificing love. That love exhibited upon the cross in an infinite measure. Father, bless us this day on your holy Sabbath to draw closer to you and deeper in our understanding of your will for us. For we pray this in Jesus' powerful name, Father. Amen. Amen. Amen.